player development philosophy. What does it mean? Who is in charge of philosophy? What is your role? This is a message to youth soccer coaches and parents. Youth soccer is now a well-established pastime in North America, with millions of young players actively participating in organized soccer at every level, from recreational to elite. The health of the game is evident everywhere one looks. There are thousands of youth clubs, hundreds of tournaments, great facilities everywhere, and plenty of organized play in a sophisticated structure. In order to support the growth and popularity of youth soccer, the state soccer associations conduct courses for youth coaches, most of whom are volunteer parent coaches. There's also a growing need for parent education programs. Parents are an integral part of youth clubs, and the most committed parents end up being on boards of these clubs. Parents, therefore, have a huge influence on the running of youth soccer in America. Most coaching courses typically include a section on player development. And when coaches discuss player development, invariably the term player development philosophy comes up. What is a player development philosophy? Is there a right way and a wrong way to develop players? Who decides on the philosophy? And what is the role of the parents and coaches regarding the philosophy? These are not easy questions to answer. To complicate matters, youth soccer in America is a reflection of the American melting pot and the country's sheer size. We're dealing here with a country the size of a continent and a population that's multi-ethnic. Many of them come from different soccer backgrounds. You're watching a typical American soccer tournament, in this case, the State Cup tournament in Georgia. Observe the play and ask yourself the following questions. Do the players have good ball control? Do they make good decisions? Are they creative? Is this good soccer? The game you're watching now is a U14 girls game in the State Cup tournament. Compare the playing style of the two teams. The white team seems to emphasize ball possession, while the black team tries to get the ball forward quickly. Watch how most of the players on the white team try to control the ball first and look for supporting teammates close to the ball, while the black team players look for an early long pass. Which style is more effective? Which style is more conductive to player development? Which style is more enjoyable to watch? Now observe this under-14 boys semifinal game from the State Cup. It's a bit too frantic, with very little control or possession. Is it frantic because of lack of skill? Or are the stakes so high that there's too much pressure on the players to play with composure? Are they playing at a speed that they can handle technically? Recent results by U.S. national teams in international competition suggest that we're still a long way from developing world-class players. Many national staff coaches are alarmed by the trends they see in youth soccer. John Hackworth, the U.S. Under-17 men's national team coach, recently told Soccer America magazine, quote, the emphasis on winning is a deterrent to young players because it prevents us from developing technically proficient players and we're not giving them the ability to make decisions, unquote. Hackworth continues to say, that you can't find youth soccer games where coaches aren't screaming the whole time, telling kids what they should and should not do. Tab Ramos, the great U.S. midfielder who is now a New Jersey soccer coach, tells Soccer America, quote, that players here clear it, get rid of it, pass it, kick it up the line. And they hear it so often by the time they're 13 and 14, when they do get the ball and they don't hear instructions, then they don't know what to do. If our players are not as creative as players from the other countries, the question is why? What are the players taught in other countries? Which is different from what we teach here. To get some answers to these questions, we traveled to Rio to look at the player development system in Brazil. We chose Brazil because it's universally acknowledged that Brazil produces more world-class players than any other nation. Brazil is also a huge country divided into states, just like the U.S. And just like here, each state in Brazil organizes their own soccer setup. In the state of Rio, there are 38 professional clubs, 14 in the first division, 
14 in the second division, and 10 in the third division. Each professional club has youth teams starting at the under 13 age group. The youth teams play in the same division as their professional team. For example, Flamingo is a professional team that plays in the first division, which means that all their youth teams play against the youth teams from other first division clubs. In fact, you're now watching a U16 game between Flamingo and Botafogo in the Rio First Division Youth League. The earliest age in which they hold a national championship in Brazil is at the under-17 level. The under-17 national championship is held once a year, over a two-week period, in one location, and every club from every division can participate if they can afford the fee and the travel expenses. In Rio, the very best players in all age groups, starting at the under-13 level, are picked up by the big and famous first division clubs, such as Flamingo, Fluminense, Vasco da Gama, and Botafogo. The next best players try out for the smaller first division clubs, and then for the second and then third division clubs. If players in Brazil are signed up by professional clubs at around the age of 10 or 11, how do they develop before the age of 10? The answer is futsal. The first experience of organized soccer for Brazilian children is a game of futsal. Futsal is a 5v5 game played on a hard floor using a very small ball that doesn't bounce much. Kids as young as 5 start playing futsal in social clubs, sports clubs, or also in school. Futsal is the most common soccer experience of players between the ages of 5 and 10. After that, players can either switch to outdoor soccer or stay in futsal or even do both. You are now watching a practice session by the professional futsal team of Vasco da Gama. Watch the scrimmage and observe the players' ball control, quick passes, and the constant interchanging of positions. This is a game that prepares Brazilians for the outdoor game. All the great players we've seen in the World Cup, such as Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, and Kaka, started life as futsal players. Futsal is also played a lot in school. Many of the schools in Rio lack resources and space. For them, futsal is an ideal solution since it requires little space and maintenance. You're watching a typical school futsal tournament. The girls are 14 and 15 years old. Watch the skill required to play this game. The quick passes and dribbling. Watch how they place their foot on the ball to control it. Since this is midday on Tuesday, there are no adults here except the coaches and the officials. The parents, presumably, are at work. Watching the games are the boys teams waiting for their turn to play. Imagine Parkview High School playing Brookwood High School in the midday in an empty stadium with just a few schoolmates watching. This is school soccer, Brazilian style. Another type of soccer widely played in Rio is beach soccer. Every Sunday, kids of all ages play in beach soccer leagues. You're watching a beach soccer game for 9 and 10 year olds on the famous Copacabana Beach.
Watch the way they flick the ball in order to volley it. Brazilians are mad about soccer. The kids play it all the time. Between futsal, beat soccer, school soccer, and pickup games in the neighborhood, the children are always practicing and playing. And when there's no pickup game, they just practice on their own and try to master the tricks they saw their idols do on television games or live games. Young players in Brazil have such a variety of soccer experiences that it brings into perspective the endless debates that we have here with coaches, parents and administrators about the game. For example, we have such a hard time convincing parent coaches that there is no need for throw-ins at U6 and U8. Parents think that if we don't teach throw-ins, that somehow is going to hurt their players' development. But in Brazil, young kids play futsal and there are no throw-ins in futsal. They just kick it in and it doesn't seem to hurt their development. Parent coaches here are so worried about the rules, they feel uncomfortable if the rules are not consistent. They think it's going to confuse their child. In Brazil, a typical 5 to 10 year old plays in the same week futsal, soccer on grass and beat soccer and each game is totally different with different rules, different playing surfaces and different balls. Yet they don't seem confused. Each game teaches them different skills that they eventually bring to the outdoor game. For example, futsal is great for quick control in tight areas and combination plays. Beat soccer is great for agility and reaction and building up strength and stamina running in deep sand. It also teaches them to improvise with the flicks and passing and volleying. Different rules broaden the soccer experiences and problem solving ability. After all, in practice, coaches try to expose the players to different activities with different rules to expand their problem solving abilities. So if, it's, if it works in practice, why not in games? We don't keep scores at U8, so why is it so important to have consistency in the rules? Those who can afford it sign their kids to a soccer school. Many ex-pros in Brazil start their own soccer school where players from the age of 6 to 16 pay for professional training. This is basically Brazil's version of recreational soccer. All the players who are not good enough for the pro clubs and who can't afford it pay to join soccer schools. The Zico Academy, owned by one of Brazil's greatest ever players, is one of the biggest and best organized soccer schools in Rio. The aim of the school is to teach players soccer skills. The academy has 600 players from the ages 6 to 16. Players pay 50 US dollars per month for 12 months and get three sessions per week. The soccer schools don't play in a league, but once a month the Zico Academy organizes an in-house tournament and occasionally they will arrange for an exhibition game against the other schools. This in a nutshell is the structure of youth soccer in Brazil. The youth teams of the first division clubs are the equivalent of our classic one soccer. Their second division youth teams are like our classic two soccer. Their third division is like our classic three soccer. And their soccer schools are like our recreational programs. And most kids play a combination of futsal, street soccer, beach soccer, until they become a teenager and focus on one type of soccer or another. But what about the Brazilian player development philosophy? Brazilians regard soccer as an artistic expression. Brazilian players see themselves as artists and like to entertain the audience and show their tricks. That's not to say that they don't play to win. Coaches and players everywhere play to win. But in Brazil, youth coaches encourage the players to express themselves and to be creative with the ball. And no matter how important the game is, they never change this philosophy. The most common instruction coaches in Brazil shout to their players is calme. It means relax, keep your composure. It means don't just kick it. Keep the ball until you see an option. It means uh, shield it if you have to and wait for support. 
It means if you're meeting a cross, don't hit it first time if it's bouncing awkwardly. Control it with your first touch and place it in the net. Calme, you hear it all the time. Brazilian teams train much more often than we do here and don't play as many games. Youth players in the pro clubs from U13 onwards train Monday to Friday, five times per week, and play one game on the weekend. Occasionally, they will play two games in one week, but the second game would typically be played on a Wednesday morning. They would never play multiple games on the weekend like we do. Recreational players train three times per week in their soccer schools. They all work on technique in almost every session. In Brazil, each age group of a youth team could have as many as 40 players. On the weekend, only 11 players play. The rest of the players don't get to play in the game. But it's what they do Monday to Friday that develops them. They place high importance on the training and the technical development in training. Here, we think that players develop by playing games, and we play too many games and we don't train enough. And when we do train, most of it is geared towards preparing the team for the next game. So we do a lot more team development than player development here, and the individual skill suffers. Let's start with the very young ones. From the very beginning, the coaches encourage the players to control the ball and express themselves. You're watching a U8 practice session at the Zico Academy Soccer School, where they're working on dribbling. Remember, this is recreational soccer. You're watching a U8 game. This is the only official game they'll play since there's no league in this age. As you can see, the coaches double up as referees. Watch how the kids dribble a lot. No one is concerned that they're not spreading out. No one is trying to teach them positions. No one is shouting at them to pass. They just let them play. Watch how the player's first instinct is to keep the ball. They rarely run at the ball and just kick it. They all love to dribble it, and they're not discouraged from doing that. The parents are all there because these are very young kids. They're sitting around where the camera is, but you don't hear them shouting at the players. The only voice you hear is the coach. One of the striking differences between Brazil and the U.S. is the level of involvement and the behavior of the parents. The parents in Brazil don't get as involved with their child's soccer. Most of the time, they're not even there. And when they are present, they're simply passive onlookers. Remember that the kids you're watching here are not impoverished children from the slums of Rio. These are kids from well-to-do families living in the suburbs of Rio and whose parents pay club fees so their kids can play soccer. Sounds familiar? This is the closest thing to American Youth Club, and yet the parents stay in the background and don't interfere. If you compare the environment you just saw at, at U8 in Brazil to the typical experience of U8 players here in Georgia, the contrast is huge. In a typical U8 game here, the parents are right on, on the sidelines, on top of the players, and are constantly shouting at the players to kick it, to cross it, to shoot it. The coaches are constantly telling the players where to stand and where to move. The American parents are not watching the game passively. They are part of the game, and the players are not given the chance to make their own decisions. This is a U13 scrimmage at the Zico Academy. These players are recreational players and are not good enough for the pro clubs, yet observe the skill level and the tactical awareness. Many of these players would be good enough for our Classic 1 team. Watch how they rarely kick the ball aimlessly without looking. They are always looking to play with skill and imagination. Some of the parents are sitting behind the camera and they're very quiet, even though this is the official game of the week for their child's team. If you came home and saw your daughter playing Monopoly with her friends, 
would you run and stand behind her and start shouting, roll a dice, roll a five, buy that house, don't go to jail. You wouldn't do that because you recognize that this is your daughter's leisure activity where she spends time with her friends and nothing else. But soccer is also a leisure activity for your daughter in exactly the same way. Now, the children like it when their parents are watching them play soccer. They want to show their parents the new tricks they learned in practice, and they feel safer knowing that their parents are there. We want the parents to be there and enjoy watching their kids. But in the U.S., parents have a tough time just being passive supporters. They become too overbearing. Unfortunately, some of the parents become emotionally engaged in the game and allow the competitiveness to get the better of them. This is when the game gets a little nasty, a nasty edge to it, when parents start shouting at the players and criticizing referees' decisions. They become part of the game, and they shouldn't. It doesn't happen in Brazil. A few years ago, Georgia Soccer had a silent Saturday, where the coaches and the parents were asked to keep quiet and refrain from coaching from the sidelines for one game. Most parents didn't like the silent Saturday. They have a tough time staying detached and just watching the game. When you think of it, in Brazil, every game is a silent Saturday at the youth level because most of the time the parents are not there and when they are there, they just sit quietly and watch. Once the best players sign up with the pro clubs at U13, they train every day of the week. This is a practice scrimmage of the under-13 team in the ZFC club, which is a second division club owned by Zico. In this scrimmage, it's the players in the blue and red against the green. Watch the skill level of the players. They're very comfortable with the ball and have a lot of composure. They rarely get rid of it with hopeful kicks upfield. If they kick it without a specific target in mind, their coach would tell them off and say, Calme. Notice how the little players are not afraid to keep the ball. Remember that these are Division II players. This is their classic two level players. This is a U13 practice in a little town of Paul Granja, outside of Rio. This is the hometown of Garincha, one of Brazil's greatest ever players. This team belongs to a third division club, which makes it the equivalent to our Classic 3. For a third level, the skill of the players is impressive. There are around 40 players in this team. One coach is working here with the starting 11 on passing patterns while the rest of the players are on an adjacent field working on technique and possession. We are now watching a U15 league game between ZFC and Madreira in the second division, their version of Classic 2 soccer. This is 9 a.m. on a Wednesday. There are no parents present, just a handful of Madreira fans who are shouting at the referee every time he makes a call against their team. You can see that although these players are not the very best, they're still quite good and still try to play with possession and control, even on such a bumpy field. It doesn't always succeed. Here the team loses the ball trying to play out of the back. 
but they won't change the way they play and will continue to play out of the back. Brazilian youth coaches understand that the key to player development is technique, skill, and the freedom for young players to make their own decisions and express themselves. They have a conviction in their method that is based on the history of producing the most skillful players in the world. They know this philosophy works. They're comfortable with it. There is a tradition, a history that no one can argue against. No parent or fan would question their player development philosophy because these are the coaches who produce Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, Roberto Carlos, and hundreds like them. Brazil exports a thousand players per year to leagues all over the world. But here in the U.S., if a coach was to tell his parents in the preseason that he's going to emphasize possession soccer and individual development, the parents will go, okay, whatever. But as soon as the team concedes a goal because a defender lost the ball trying to play out of the back, they all gang up on the coach and tell him the philosophy doesn't work. And the poor coach will have a tough time defending his methods. Because here, we don't have tradition or history of producing great players. The youth coaches don't have the conviction to stand their ground against criticism. The problem in the U.S. is that no one has the credibility or authority to say this is how we must develop players. In some ways, the melting pot is a hindrance because if so many different soccer backgrounds, no one is seen as the ultimate authority. The club directors of coaching don't have the credibility. Even the state directors of coaching and the national staff coaches don't have the credibility to shape the philosophy. In most other countries, the philosophy was influenced by the top, and player development was filtered from the top down. In the U.S., the player development philosophy is evolving from the bottom up. Which brings us back to the original question as to why American players lag behind in skill development. The answer cannot be found in a coaching manual. There are no special drills or magic formations that Brazilian coaches use. Our coaches use the same drills in practice sessions. The difference is in the mindset, the tradition, and above all, the philosophy. It's a philosophy based on the belief and conviction that in soccer, superior skill and creativity will always win out at the end, and that coaches and parents must not coach creativity out of players. Our coaches don't allow the players to solve their own problems. From the very beginning, our players are overcoached. Not only are they overcoached, but the instructions that they get are often based on misplaced adult perception of playing the percentage game or safe play. Listen to the coaching. Get it down. Spread it out. Get out of trouble. Swing it. Swing it. Early time. Earlier. Come on, don't, don't touch talking. Good. Good. Look at Jack's feet. Early. Turn. Be with them, Scott. The average American parent doesn't really care that our youth clubs don't produce players for the national team that are good enough to win World Cups. The average parent only cares that his or her child has an enjoyable soccer experience and that down the road it might bring a college scholarship and a free education. My advice to the parents is that if you want your child to reach his soccer potential, you need to let them play and let, let them learn on their own by trial and error. It's the best way to learn. Be there for them and cheer them, but don't become part of the game. It's not your game. It's their game to discover. Some parents feel that since they are paying the fees to the club, they are entitled to have a say in how the player development is conducted at the club. But, for example, if you are paying your lawyer's fees, does that entitle you to tell your lawyer how to prepare your case? And if you pay your dentist's fees, does that entitle you to tell him how to extract your tooth? The bottom line is that coaches are trained and certified to coach and are getting paid a fee for their expertise, 
just like any other profession. Listen to the parents coaching from the sideline in this game. The result is soccer that looks like this. Many of our youth coaches say that player development philosophy is great in theory, but the pressure to win tournaments such as State Cup is too great. They have to compete and do whatever it takes to win and cannot worry about playing pretty soccer. But consider this, the pressure to win exists everywhere, not just in the U.S. If you think that our youth coaches are under pressure, rest assured that the Brazilian youth coaches in this U16 game between Flamingo and Botafogo are under much bigger pressure. These rivalries are long on tradition and go much deeper than any state cup game. The players are playing for their professional contract, for their livelihood, the coaches will get fired if they lose too many games against their hated rivals. These guys hate losing. We don't know of any club coach in Georgia that lost his job because his team didn't win the state cup, but the pressure on the Brazilian coaches and the players is enormous. The game is fast paced and intense, yet watch how both teams play with purpose and skill and with an emphasis on possession. Players here rarely just boot it forward and chase. There's a rhythm to the game that you rarely see in youth soccer in America. Everything is executed with a soccer solution in mind and with a great support play around the ball. Regardless of the stakes, coaches in Brazil do not change their philosophy. If you think Brazilians don't care about winning, watch their reaction after they score a goal. In Brazil, the pressure to win does not interfere with the player development. Unfortunately, in the U.S., coaches let the pressure to win get in the way of their player development. It's as simple as that. The lesson is clear. Parents need to stop coaching from the sidelines and let the coaches be in charge of the team. Parents also need to research and make sure that the club they signed their child has the right philosophy, where the coaches encourage the players to play with skill and creativity. Every country is unique with its own playing style and structure. And we can't just copy Brazil or any other country and try and play like them. It's impossible to replicate the slums of Rio in Alpharetta, Georgia. But we can learn many valuable lessons from other countries. So what can we learn from Brazil? Well, firstly, we don't have to spend thousands of dollars sending our kids to play in tournaments all over the country for them to become good players. Ronaldo probably didn't set foot outside his neighborhood until he was a teenager. Secondly, we don't have to worry so much about making our rules consistent with the adult version of the game for our kids. Again, the best players in Brazil, they didn't become as good as they are because they learn how to take throw-ins at U8. Thirdly, our players are playing way too many games and they don't train enough. We need to reverse that. And lastly, the reason Ronaldo and Robinho and Kaká are some of the best players in the world is because the youth coaches allow them to do the tricks in the games, allow them to improvise, and didn't coach imagination out of the game. And I think that's the most important lesson that we have to learn from Brazil.